Okay, and hello, welcome to the College Salsa podcast. And today we have a very special guest, uh, Mark Emblidge, who is the Assistant Director of Undergraduate Admissions at the Rochester Institute of Technology. So welcome, Mr. Emblidge. Thank you, RJ. So as uh, I talked about earlier, our topic today is kind of you know, with college admissions at a selective you know, institution of American higher education. Uh, you know, Mr. Emblidge, Try and answer some questions. I'm sure give us tips to, to students uh, what to do. So let's start with like the basic information is if, if I'm a student or a parent, uh, the high school student, what's the application process for a uh, like a selective undergraduate institution? Well, there's typically several parts to a to an application. Nowadays, most students tend to use what's called the common application. Uh, to apply, and that's a single application you can use to apply to a number of different schools. And I think uh, a lot of schools across the country will accept the common application, especially private institutions, but a lot of state institutions do as well. But some schools have their own application as well. And then the things that, that round out the application, obviously the main thing is your high school transcript, your academic record. Uh, that is going to tell an admissions committee or, or a single person reading an application um, what your academic record is like. What classes did you take? What was the rigor of those classes? Did you take them at a standard college preparatory level? Did you take advantage of opportunities to take honors classes, advanced placement classes, international baccalaureate classes, college classes, things like that? Um, Certainly the grades and grade point average will be a factor that schools are going to look at. Uh, working for an institute of technology, for many of the programs that we offer, we're gonna put more focus on how a student did in say their math and science classes than how they did in their English or history or foreign language or electives. But again, it depends on what major they're applying to. Not all of the majors that, that we offer are necessarily STEM oriented, but many of them are, and many of our most popular majors are. Um, another big issue, it's been a big issue for a long time, but that's standardized test scores. They're rather controversial. Uh, there, are, there are certainly pros and cons to using standardized tests, but especially now with the pandemic going on, uh, the school where I work and many other schools have gone test optional. So students have the option to provide uh, an SAT or an ACT score. And uh, with our applicant pool this year, we saw just about a 50-50 mix of students who decided to apply test optional, meaning they didn't provide SAT or ACT scores, and those who decided they wanted their scores to be uh, considered. Now, another factor this year, 2021, 2020, 21, with the pandemic going on is a lot of students were not able to take tests. Tests kept getting canceled, that sort of thing. So that's why RIT, where I work, and many other schools, uh, if they weren't there already, have made the move to being test optional. Uh, some schools are doing that like we are um, for the foreseeable future. We're not planning to change back to uh, requiring tests. Uh, others are just doing it for a year or two or three because of the of the pandemic and how it's affected students. Yeah, now, a, lot, a lot of students they wonder which test should I take? You know, should I take the ACT or SAT? Do you have any advice for which test a student should take? No, not really. There, there are a lot of it tends to be geographic. Although I think some of that has faded away. Uh, some states tend to seem to use the SAT more. And that was the more popular test for a long time, but the ACT ha has gained a lot of ground and there are, there are pockets of the US, especially in the Midwest, where a lot of students choose to uh, provide the ACT. What's pretty common to do also is that students will take both tests. And while the grading scales are very different, there are, there are, there are concordance tables you can use to compare the two and decide which did I do better on and then make that the test that you take a second time to see if you can improve your score. Uh, many schools uh, will do what's called super scoring. That means if you took, let's say the SAT more than once 
and maybe one time your verbal or reading writing score was higher and the next time you took it that score went down but your math score went up so scoop, super scoring would be would mean you're taking those the two best scores and putting them together into a a, a super score that's probably more likely to happen with the ACT because the ACT has five or sorry has four subscores instead of just two so it's more likely if you take it multiple times that you're going to see some scores go up and others that go down. Um, but either way, uh, if you combine them, you can do that into a into a super score. Okay. And for like RIT, does it also require like an essay? That's another. That's certainly another factor that we consider. Um, what I love about the essay, well, first of all, I was an English education major in college. So for me, it's a chance to kind of get out the proverbial red pen and look for run on sentences and comma splices and, and things that excite me. Uh, but but seriously, it's it, what I say about the essay is that it's a chance for the student to go beyond the numbers, beyond your test scores, beyond your class rank, beyond your grade point average and help us get to know you as a person to hear about some significant experience in your life. And uh, sometimes it's it's uh, getting involved in FIRST Robotics or my, my Boy Scout hike uh, out in, in New Mexico. I've read a lot of essays like that over the years. Uh, students who built their own computers. Um, but sometimes they're also very sad stories. Students who've had to overcome a great deal, illnesses, uh, losses of family members, things like that. So there are there are some essays we read that 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 really tug at us emotionally. Um, but the important thing with the essay, I think, is to present yourself well. It gives us an idea of how well you communicate. Sometimes students use it as a chance to show them overcoming adversity and, and persevering uh, despite challenges that they've faced. Um, and that can be impressive. Other times they're more simplistic. Sometimes they're just fun. Um, things I like people to avoid when writing an essay, try not to just make it all one paragraph. Try to divide it up into parts like your teachers taught you to do. Uh, I also don't like the student who tries to over, I were just to, to impress us with their use of what I call SAT words. You know, they, they learned all these words as they were studying for the SAT or ACT, and they wanna see how many of them they can use in an essay. Um, I talk to high school students on a daily basis. Students don't talk that way, so you shouldn't write that way. You should try to have the essay be more or less in your own voice. Uh, another suggestion about the essay is to run it by another set of eyes. You could read over your own essay multiple times and keep missing the same error that somebody else might look at once and say, oh, that word is spelled incorrectly. You use the wrong form of their or its or whatever. Um, so it's good, to, it's good to get someone else's feedback uh, before you hit submit. Okay, and as an admissions person, I will assume that you get to read all these essays. Can you kind of tell like, you know, when reading an essay, if the student wrote it or not, because I think one things I've heard allegedly that like parents or other people will write the essay for the student, and you can kind of tell that yes, that is this is not a, from a traditional age high school student wanting to come to college. Yeah, sometimes you do get a sense of that. Uh, where I see it also is there are things you would write in advance, like the essay. And then some applications are also going to have short answers that students might be more likely to write as they're submit as they're submitting their their application. And so sometimes you see a drastic difference between the prepared essay and the ones that they write uh, as they're submitting their application. So that's often a um, an indication that something isn't kosher here. Uh, somebody else probably helped them with that uh, that essay. Um, a lot of it comes down to, you know, the honor system. We, yeah. we want to believe that you actually wrote this and the information you're providing on your application is, is genuine and it's written by you. Certainly it's okay to, again, have somebody else look it over and maybe make some suggestions, not to write it for you, but just to provide some feedback. That's, that's certainly fine. 
Yeah, and in this day and age, do they still require like letters of recommendation? Most schools do. Uh, we only require one, but I would say many of the applications I read will have two, three, four recommendations. Um, and sometimes that's necessary. Maybe, for example, you got a new guidance counselor going into your senior year. And in a couple months, this person is supposed to write a recommendation for you. And you know, they might not know you very well at all. That's a great opportunity to turn to a teacher, uh, an employer, a mentor, somebody who knows you well and say, hey, would you mind writing a recommendation for me for college as well? Because I feel like you know me better than my than my guidance counselor or college counselor does. Um, please don't go overboard, though. Um, I, I read a book a number of years ago by a woman who worked in admissions at Duke University. And while she was there, they had a student who submitted 35 letters of recommendation. Believe me, when you are making your application this thick, whether in reality or in cyberspace, you're not necessarily endearing yourself to the person or people who are reading your application. So use discretion. Um, some schools will say we will accept no more than two applications or two recommendations. So, and if they get more than two, they're going to take the first two that they received. So make sure you're paying attention to the guidelines that colleges are telling you, you know, about how many recommendations to submit. Again, RIT, where I work, requires only one, but it's pretty common for students to submit two or three. Anything more than that, again, is probably overkill. Yeah. And I know a big thing with the applications is deadlines. So like what different deadlines do you have at RIT with, for applications? So schools sometimes have different application plans like early decision and early action. The difference between these is early decision and early action are both plans that allow you to hear from a college or university sooner than you would if you apply what's called regular decision. So. The difference is early decision plans are binding, meaning you're telling that school, you are my first choice school. If you admit me, I plan to enroll at your institution. And once I commit to your institution, I'm going to withdraw the other applications that I have uh, out to other schools because it's not fair to, to keep those open once you've already committed to go to another school. Um, early action is the non-binding form of early decision. So you're still, you're still going to hear from the school sooner, but you're not under an obligation to commit to that school and you have longer to make that decision. Um, so, th so, th so those are important differences to understand. Now there are nuances. Uh, we call our early decision plan friendly because it's a little more flexible than a lot of traditional early decision plans. So it's important to know any, any nuances like that about a plan. And then separate from that is regular decision. And that's where the bulk of most schools' applications will come. We might be their first choice school. We might be their third choice school. We might be their, their 12th choice school. But we're one of the schools they chose to apply to. Um, another related thing is some schools notify students at a, at a fixed date. And others use what's called rolling admission. So the sooner you apply, the sooner you hear back from a school. I think rolling admission generally is more popular with public institutions or state schools than it is with private. Most private schools tend to have more of a fixed schedule. Yeah, and what's your uh, way that you let students know if they accept it or not? Do you do all the letters on one day or do you do the... So, well, first of all, we have basically three different, at RIT, we have three different notification timelines. There's early decision one, yeah. which um, we those students apply by uh, early November, um, and, and they're going to hear uh, typically in, in December. Uh, and then there's an early decision two for that student who maybe decided a little bit later, this is my first choice school. They apply by January 1st, and they're notified by the middle of January. So we turn those around pretty quickly. And then the regular decision students apply by January 15th, but and we notify them by the middle of March. So there's different timelines depending on which plan you use. Um, we don't 
run all of our letters on the same day. We tend to send our decisions out in waves. It's not a true rolling decision process. Uh, we do wait until a certain time before we start to release those. Um, but but that's that's kind of how that process works. So we we do them in in waves, but not all on the same day. Now, some schools, like I think the Ivy Leagues, are well known for releasing all of their decisions, uh, unless it was early decision, on um, April 1st. So it varies depending on the school. And, and are schools pretty much sending things electronically now? Or are they still st sending letters in the mail? Uh, for we still get some things through the US Postal Service, but long gone are the days when we would you know, come in and see bin after bin after bin after bin full of mail, uh, transcripts, that sort of thing. The vast majority of documents we get now are sent to us electronically. The letters of recommendation, the transcripts, the applications themselves. Um, there is still some use of paper applications out there, that sort of thing, but um, the vast majority of, of what we get now, we get electronically. Okay, and for like high school students, you know, let me tell, or tell me a little bit more about like RIT. What type of student be, would be a good fit to be attending RIT? So one thing about RIT is that we're very career oriented. So we wanna give students a great education, but we also want them to be prepared for what's next after they graduate. So whether that means going right into the working world, which is what majority of our, our graduates do, but it might very well mean going on to graduate school, law school, medical school. Uh, there's always a small percentage that might do uh, military or Peace Corps, Teach America, some sort of service type learning, that sort of thing. So, um, but whatever that is, we want we want you to be prepared for it. So, the students who uh, you know apply to RIT um, tend to be kind of career focused. They have an idea of what they want to do. It doesn't mean they never change their mind. Our students change their minds about their majors all the time like they do anywhere else. But when they commit to RIT, in many cases, they're committing to a major that might require them to do a series of paid internships called co-ops. RIT is a co-op school, and that's a big part of what we do. Some students are completing as much as a year or more of these co-ops during their time in college so that when they graduate, they've got their bachelor's degree but they also have a resume that could have three months, six months, 12 months or more of full-time paid professional work experience. Uh, there's other forms of experience-based learning as well, undergraduate research, study abroad. Uh, some majors require a senior capstone project. Uh, others might require an internship or something like that. Uh, there's opportunities for entrepreneurship and creativity. So these are all different types of experiential learning, and some are more popular than others depending on the major, but, um, but they are all things that will help a student build up their resume while they're in school. Okay, and then one, uh, I guess, do you have any, you know, other like tips for, you know, for admissions officers to tell students and parents like what's kind of like the you know a few things that you know they tend not to do that could hurt them in the application process so <clears throat> there are a few things first of all another factor that many schools consider and now that we've gone test optional uh at rit uh we're doing this a little bit more is demonstrated interest um, you know, you could apply to a school, but if, if the records show that you never did a, a, an official visit to that school, uh, right now, because of the pandemic, we've got a lot of virtual events going on. If our records show you never participated in one of those, it makes us question how serious you are about, about our school. And if you are, haven't really demonstrated that interest, we will have an idea that you're probably less likely to enroll if offered admission. So demonstrated interest is, is one thing to keep in mind. Um, certainly it is important to pay attention to deadlines. Some schools will be stricter about deadlines than others. At RIT, we have um, courses that we require or recommend that you've taken prior to applying. For example, if you are applying to our College of Engineering, and you are missing either pre-calculus, physics, or chemistry, 
we can't consider you for admission to the College of Engineering. So it's important to know that if there are specific classes you have to ha have to have when you apply to a certain major, make sure you take those. I, I've read a lot of applications over the years where a student looks very promising based on their grades and everything else. And then when I go through that checklist of required classes, they're missing one of those classes. And it's, it's, it's frustrating that we can't offer them admission because otherwise they're very qualified, but we do need to see that physics class or that pre-calc class or chemistry uh, as part of the admission process. Um, another required document is if you're applying to an art program, uh, schools will often require an art portfolio uh, as part of the process. If you're applying to a music school, obviously there's a, a taper, an audition uh, that you have to go through. So some of these more specialized areas might have other requirements also to keep in mind. Okay, and then uh, you know, one last question I like to ask, you know, guess was if, if you could talk a little bit about your process when you were a high school student looking to go to college, what were some of the things you were looking for and how did you decide to go to the school that you went to? So it was a lot different back then. Uh, <laughs> the, the technology, I, I went to went to college in the in the 1980s, the mid 1980s. I graduated from high school in 1982. And uh, so there, 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 we didn't have the Internet. Uh, there were computers, but they were relatively not very sophisticated. But they, there was a uh, a service that my high school offered, and I, I think it was uh, called GIS, Guidance Information Service. And basically, I remember going down to the library, and you could sit down, and you could you could pick out things that you're looking for, like a uh, a certain geographic region, you know, maybe maybe I wanted to stay in New York State, or maybe I wanted to go to a different part of the country. Um, but you could put in what kind of majors you're looking for, um, maybe certain sports that you're you're interested in. Um, is there a vegetarian meal plan available? Uh, test scores. So you could put all this information in, and it would spit out a list of schools to you. Um, and, and so I use that a, a lot in terms of, of my process. Um, one thing that I did, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend to others, is I only applied to one school. Um, fortunately, I got into that school. Uh, otherwise, I would have been like, uh oh, I didn't get into that school. Now what? So it is good to have, you know, several schools uh, on your list. And a lot of people, uh, college advisors will often talk about quote unquote, safety schools versus a reach school, that sort of thing. A safety school means that based on that school's academic profile, you feel pretty comfortable that you're going to get into that school if you apply. A reach might be a school that maybe you're not quite there, but it's the place you really want to go. So you, you know, you, you reach and, and kind of hope that, that they're going to admit you. So Please don't apply to just one school unless you do it as an early decision student where you'll get a decision earlier on. And if you do get rejected by that school, you still have time to submit applications to other schools. Yeah, that's uh, a very good advice uh, to have. So again, thank you so much for your time. And uh, you're welcome. I know, I know you're busy probably. I don't, I don't know if you're still going over applications or that process over yet or you we're, we're we're winding down on that our we're, our goal is to get our decisions out by the middle of march right now we're in the middle of february so uh our our committee is meeting daily to kind of sift through uh do second reads and third reads on applications uh to to figure to figure these things out so um one other thing i want to mention that i didn't mention before is is interviews um many schools will offer the opportunity to uh, interview and some school for some schools this is an evaluative process for others it's it's really meant to be more informative but it is another form of demonstrated interest and if a school offers that option and it's a school you're really interested in try to take advantage of it yeah yeah and i'll also add the importance of doing a campus visit if you're yeah. unsure it's it's a good thing to go not just you know do the tour and everything, but you know go to the student center, look who's there, are there people around there that look like you, and even you know go at nighttime because again a campus could look a lot different at nighttime than it does yep. during the daytime. So yeah, uh, yeah, it's easy to fall in love with the school on a website, 
And then you get to that school and it's like, oh, this is not what I expected it to be. So yeah, the, the, the school visit, if you're able to do it, is very important at some point in the process before committing to that school. Obviously, if you are an international student, you're across the ocean, uh, sometimes it just isn't feasible to, to visit that school and you accept the offer based on what you know. Uh, but, uh, but if you can make it to a school, um, and that's part of the search process also, is to look at different types of schools, an urban school versus a suburban school versus a rural school. Uh, would you be more comfortable at a small school being what they call a, a big fish in a small pond? Or would you rather be a small fish in a big pond and go to a very large school? Different schools are right for different people. No school is perfect for everyone, but you have to find the one that is the best fit for you. Yep, and that's uh, uh, good advice. And again, with the pandemic and everything going on, it's even harder to do visits and stuff like that. So sure is. And then, like I said, you wanting to go somewhere and finding out your classes instead of being in class are going to be remote. Uh, and, that, and that's a that's a learning yeah thing. And that's you know something that again you. Yeah, we don't have control over, it, but you know we want to make sure the safety of everyone's, uh, you know that that's, that that's got to be paramount. That's yeah. got to be paramount. Yep, yeah. looking out for the safety of everyone in that community. Yeah. So again, well, thank you so much for your time, and uh, you're welcome. If we have another topic that uh, we could use your assistance on, we may bring you back for another interview. Please do. Thank all you. Right. All